Good morning. Good morning, church. You know, that's a good declaration, right? That, Lord, we need you. I think one of my favorite parts in that song is when it says that holiness is Christ in me. And there are certain words in the scriptures that are very difficult for us to uh, comprehend or to connect with. And one of the words that's very difficult, I always feel, is holiness. Because we hardly see anything in this world that we would merit as holy, right? And so, uh, Bethel, come on up. And um, one of the things that I've tried over the years when I'm trying to help people, when I'm teaching them uh, in a theology class, and I say, okay, how can I express what holy is, this concept? And there are holy moments that I can connect with that makes sense to me. And so I think of like precious times where people have been so unselfish and so sacrificial that it's apparent to all. I know of a, of a, a man who loved his wife who was uh, mentally failing and he just committed himself to love her and pursue her and love her and pursue her even when she has forgotten who he is. Um, it's a holy moment. Something that's so beautiful, right? And then I think of like when my children were born. When my children were born, you know, the world stopped. And I just was in awe of God, awe of this little baby that God had given to us. And I don't know how else to describe it, but a very holy moment, right? You know? And so when I think of how do you describe holiness, it can be difficult, but I had never really put that connection, and that song brought that to me, like, holiness is Christ in me. So we hear, be ye holy as I am holy. I mean, I've heard that before, and it just intimidates me. How can I be as holy as God? And here's this high standard, but what really makes sense to me is be Christ-like. Demonstrate Christ. Respond like Jesus. Display Jesus. Reflect Jesus. That I can connect with. And so holiness is Christ in me. Of course it is. If we're going to be holy like God, then being like his son is a wonderful way for us to demonstrate that holiness. So holiness is Christ in me. We have two announcements right now. Our first one is this one stepping up. Etha, would you come? And he's going to share some information. And I hope many people would consider being a part of this. Even some of you older saints coming to this class just to mentor some younger uh, men in this journey. Bethel? Hey everyone, good morning. My name is Bethel. Um, I just wanted to share a couple of things. Um, so a couple of years ago, a group of friends and I started um, this group called Man Up because we saw a need um, around you know people my age and my job and who I came into contact with that really struggled uh, in the the transition I guess from from adolescence to to manhood and um, it's something that that um, I got to experience um, you know for, from Chago from Juan and a lot of uh, people in the church and that that helped me a lot so I wanted to um, to do something where where we could um, get together with with, uh, with men and just um, like it says in Galatians, uh, bear one another's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. Um, so we're starting um, the Stepping Up series. Um, it's gonna be on Sunday evenings, five to seven. Um, our first, first uh, introduction is gonna be tonight at five here at Redeemer. Um, so I'd like to welcome y'all to, to attend. Give him a hand. Thank you, Beto, for willing to lead that. Appreciate that. We've done that series before, and it's helped many people in their life to just know how to steward their family, you know? Are you going to raise your family? Are you going to lead your wife basically the way, the way you it happened to you, right? No, we want to do it biblically. And so I want to uh, share that. I also would like to have our elders come up if Tom and Jim and Juan's already walking up here. Uh, this is Pastor Appreciation Month, and as many of you know, due to my surgery and due to um, just a lot of changes within our church from staffing and things like that, 
these men have had to take on a, a much greater load uh, from not only uh, filling the pulpit and preaching, but there's been other things that we've really had to invest in in a great way. And so we want to um, acknowledge them and, and be thankful for them. Um, if you don't understand eldership, right, if that's something totally brand new to you, we have some stuff on our table, I, I think, about elders um, and how God has designed the church to be led and shepherded uh, through uh, a, a team of people, a team, not, not just one sole individual. And I'm telling you, it really uh, makes for a much healthier church and a, a better cared for body because of that. And um, sometimes I wish I could express all the things that these men do, but I can't because some of it is private. I can't share the the counseling and the pursuing of people and the difficult conversations and the phone calls and meeting with people and giving time out of their normal life my, like my brother's very busy but i know my brother's meeting with people all the time right and that's a huge sacrifice they his wife wants him to come home and he's like i can't i'm meeting with people and so i understand those things i know tom gets up super early in the morning um, and we'll make phone calls with people. I know that Jim gets questions asked to him, and he's like, I'll get you information, and I'm, I'm just so thankful for them um, and for their shepherding in our church. And so Amen. I want to present with them. Uh, we have a gift for them, uh, for, for Jim and for Terry, for Tom and Terry and for Juan and Terry. I'm joking. Okay. <laughs> for Juan and Rachel. It just felt right. Like, what is felt God so doing? Right. It felt so right. Yeah, it's an elder requirement. <laughs> yes. But uh, we're thankful for them. And um, we have gift certificates to them to have a, uh, a hot date with their uh, loved one to go to Santa Fe Steakhouse. And so we hope that they'll go out and just splurge and enjoy one another. And so let's give them a big hand. Thank you so much, elders. So Juan's going to now come and preach the word. Um, well, I, now I feel bad because all we got you was a $10 st subway card. <laughs> <laughs> Who awesome. organized this? This is terrible. How do you follow that? I wanted to say it's Pastor Appreciation Month and, or day. And, uh, you know, many of you have attended other churches. And there are many men of God leading and shepherding, Right? Um, this is not the only church. God is building his church all over the world. But he has given us our shepherd. And this is a, a small gift from you, even though you didn't know you were doing this. Um, um, a, a small gift from the church, which in no way even comes close to saying thank you. But we love you. And appreciate you. How apropos that, is that the right word maybe? Maybe it's not. I got to be careful. I make up words sometimes. Um, I once from the front said, it, uh, you know, I hope this is a testification of your life. And my wife sat in the front just shaking, laughing. And so I got to be careful, okay? So I usually transcript what I preach. But I want to say, it's funny that we said steak, uh, Santa Fe Steakhouse. As I was sitting back here, I was praying this morning, I went to cut out um, about five pages I was like, I don't know how I'm gonna, where I'm going to cut it out from. And so I got to realize I just got to remove it and ended up moving something from the, from the very end, putting it in the way front. So I don't know how it's going to turn out today. All right. It, it got mixed like this. But kind of the, the topic we're on, we're covering a big passage, a big chunk of Scripture. And it is like a tomahawk steak from Santa Fe Steakhouse. Now, I've only had it one time. We celebrated um, with Stacy and Frank and Sarah and Israel, some dear friends of ours here at the church, and, and Chago and Trinette were there. And we went and celebrated Santa Fe Steakhouse at 40th birthday. And they came out, and the waitress was good. And she pitched me on a tomahawk steak, and she closed me, and I bought it. And we ate it, and it was the best steak we'd ever had in our life. It, apparently, it's like a cow that's massaged. They play, they play music for it. And it, all its life, it literally gets a massage every day. And it, it is that steak. And so 
So let me tell you what's, what I'm afraid is going to happen. We, we're about to feast on what's supposed to be served hot, and you're supposed to have time to savor it. But we're pulling up to the drive through window of McDonald's, and they're handing us this tomahawk steak, and we're going to have to fast food it because we have a lot we have a lot of steak to eat in a short amount of time, all right? And we got to do it while we're driving because I'm going fast. Because I, I, I had good news and bad news. The bad news is I had 16 pages, which is like an hour and 45 minutes. Tom has been there. And we are down, I'm down to 11, okay? We're talking about the fruit of the Spirit and walking in the flesh. And so here in Galatians chapter 5, if you'll turn with me there, if you have access to some type of Bible, and I hope you do, um, t- turn with me there real quick. And I want to start by reading the passage that we're going to be feasting on this morning. In Galatians chapter 5, Jim last week covered 16 and 17, and, and, and 18 really. And then, but I'm going to touch on 18 and work our way forward. I'm going to start reading from the Holy Bible on my phone because I left my Bible. Oh, there it is. But, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit, and listen carefully because he's basically describing Jesus and his character. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let me pray really quickly. Our Father God. You know exactly what is supposed to be communicated today. So I trust you. I believe you. And I know that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you will take your word and you will change lives, including mine. So be faithful to your promises. We ask in your son's name. Amen. I'm going to, rather than going verse by verse, which is how I I prepared it, I want to jump to the end And I want to describe a little bit of what the fruits of the Spirit are. Okay? I'm going to go quickly. I have a lot more than I I think we need to cover. But here's what it is. In the first three that that we read there, it's one fruit. And there's, there's nine pieces. There's nine qualities of this fruit. Okay? The first three have to do primarily with the impact that our relationship has with God through Jesus Christ. We get love, joy, and peace. Okay? I was going to skip all this, but I don't want to just skip it because I think we won't have a chance to go back over this. So love, joy, and peace. The second three, the middle three, have to do with our relationship and interactions with other people. Long-suffering or patience, kindness, and goodness. And then the final three have to do primarily with our inner state of being, our faithfulness, our gentleness or meekness, in our self-control. Considered in these terms, the fruit of the Holy Spirit produces in us, or what it produces in us will impact every relationship we can have. Building our community, our care for one another, to be a church, to be his child. The first of these is love. The second touches on our relationship with God is joy. John wrote, That which we have seen and heard concerning Jesus, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. The third quality in this is peace. 
Therefore, having been justified by faith, Paul writes, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus spoke of the nature of this peace when he said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. This will undoubtedly have an impact on us, on our, that we'll have peaceful relationships with others, but it begins with peace with God. So the first three with God, the second three with others. The first quality that directly impacts our relationship with others is long-suffering or patience. The Greek word Paul uses is the one that combines two Greek words together, makran. I don't know if that's right at all, but it sounds like Arabic or someone. Makran, which means being far away, and thumos, which means anger or wrath. Thus, Macrothumia is the word that is being used, speaks of being far from our anger, and as we might put it today, having a very long fuse on our emotions. We do not get angry quickly. Its root in a, it has its root in a confident trust in the sovereignty of God. It speaks of the quality of having a calm frame of mind while in uncertain circumstances or of bearing up while provoked or treated wrongly. It allows us to say, I don't have to have my way because God always gets his way. And his ways are better than my ways and his ways are always loving towards me. So even though what you mean for evil, God means it for good. I will smile and I will love you because my faith is in him. Another quality that touches our relationship with others is kindness or gentleness, as it is in the KJV. This speaks of the quality of being upright and thoughtful in the way we believe toward others, so as to positively benefit them. We are kind. The third quality in this category seems at first glance to be similar to, to the goodness word. This, the words in Greek can, in fact, both be translated goodness, but there is a subtle difference. There's two little differences, and this is really interesting. I don't remember who, who, who wrote this part and where I got this. The word translated goodness speaks here of the moral impulse that seeks what God would want for someone else. It seeks what God's desire is for you in a particular circumstance, while the word translated kindness refers more to the manner in which the goodness is sought. Okay, the delivery, kind of why or how. We all know certain devoted Christians who are characterized by earnest pursuit of God's will and agenda for themselves and the lives of others. God bless them, I love them. But who at the same time often fail to be gracious and kind in the way they pursue that agenda. They often mean well, but they tend to leave a lot of hurt and embittered people in the wake. I suspect that such people are inspired behind the bumper sticker, or with the inspiration behind the bumper sticker, God, please rescue me from your followers. I suspect that such people were who Mark Twain had in mind when he spoke of those who were good in the worst sense of the word. Why do I go through the details of this? These two qualities of kindness and goodness are very important balances to one another. This is why I believe they're split up Because he could have just put one, but he didn't. He put two. Goodness insights on that which is good. But kindness tempers the way in which such a pursuit is engaged so that the people are genuinely blessed and benefited and built up by that same pursuit. Kindness without goodness can be wimpy and accommodating towards sin. But goodness without kindness can be harsh and legalistic towards people. So praise God that the Holy Spirit produces both these qualities in the believer. It is him at work to do both of these. Praise God that he is at work. Our heart's desire should always be after God's goodness above all else. But perhaps Paul was led to place the word kindness before goodness in our passage in order to emphasize the manner with which God wants us to pursue the goodness in the lives of others. 
The first three qualities deal with the relationship with God and address transformation of our emotions. The second three deal with the relationship with others and address the transformation in our actions. And this leads us to the final three. These three qualities are the fruit of the Spirit. They deal with our own inner character and address the transformation in the area of our wills. The first three qualities, the first of these three qualities is faithfulness. As an honesty and integrity in our actions and reliability in our com- commitments and responsibilities. Paul uses the same word in Titus 2.10 when he says that servants should be obedient to their masters, not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity. And they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. 2.10. This quality recognizes that all of our actions, our thoughts, our motives are under the constraint and the constant observation of our loving, lo- loving Heavenly Father. Then we have gentleness or meekness. It's unfortunate that we tend to associate meekness with, with weakness. Because wimpiness and timidity are not products of the Holy Spirit. I assure you that. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind, 2 Timothy 1.7. The word Paul uses really describes a quality of moral strength in which we refuse to be overly impressed with a sense of our own importance. We have a low opinion of our own opinion. We have low value of our own way. It's meekness. It's being able to say, I don't have to have my way, we can have yours. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, Matthew 5, 5. It is an attribute of the singular fruit we're going to be talking about. Finally, the last quality in this category is self-control or temperance. This conveys the idea of restraining one's own emotions, impulses, or desires and bringing them under the rule of God. Paul gave a perfect illustration on this meeting in the word 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 25. He says, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives a prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who comp- competes for this prize is temperate in all things. Our culture says, if it feels good, do it. But those who give that advice fail to mention that many people are in prison today and have broken homes today because they acted on it. Proverbs 25, 28 says, whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down and has no walls. A person without self-control is very is the very picture of vulnerability. Such a person is controlled by self or selfishness, and by contrast, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is self-control. Again, all these different qualities give us a picture of Jesus himself. He displayed perfect love to us by giving himself Christ himself on the cross. Now he says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another, John 14, 34. He experienced perfect joy and says to us, these things have I spoken to you that that my joy may be made in you and that your joy may be full, John 15, 11. He experienced perfect peace and then tells us, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, John 14, 27. And the Bible entrusts us to the patience of Christ in 2 Thessalonians 3, 5. Reminds us that the riches of God's kindness towards us in Christ. And encourages us that the good work God has begun in us will find its completion in the day of Jesus Christ. The Bible presents Jesus to us as the one who is faithful and true. One who, though in the form of God, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even to the death of the cross. One who displayed self-control in that for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. For the Holy Spirit to display his fruit in us, nothing less than the perfect qualities of Jesus Christ himself being displayed in us 
is the goal. It's nothing less than the Holy Spirit living the life of Jesus in us, through us. Isn't this something we all truly long for? We hear that list of spiritual fruit, and if you're like me, you're left wanting like, oh, (laughs) oh, (laughs) how do I do that? I want more of that. That's the part I was going to cut out because I really want us to get to the steak. And that's pretty pretty savory stuff. And we're going to start with Galatians. I've got to back up because I want want to start where Paul starts in trying to get this part into us that we would believe in what Jesus says. He says, so I say live, walk by the Spirit, verse 16, and you will not gratify the desires of of your sinful nature. How many of us want to just not gratify the desires of our sinful nature? How many of us just want to get past that and move on and just walk like Jesus walked? They they tell us how to do it. We have the blueprint. It is so life-giving to rest in this truth. I preached about the freedom received in the Spirit and not living under the flesh several weeks back. And then Jim talked about this. Galatians 5.13, Paul tells us, You, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sin nature. Rather, serve one another in love. We have been set free to freedom. Chapter 5, verse 1. In Christ, by what Christ has done for us through his death and resurrection. But the freedom that we have been given is not so that we might indulge the flesh or the sinful nature. We are commanded on how to use this freedom that we receive through Christ. And Paul tells us, you have this freedom. Now serve one another. You are free now to serve other people. Serve them in love. He even gets a bit ambitious and says, love the way you love yourself. He's setting the bar high. But what he's saying is it's possible because Christ did this. And his spirit is in you. And his fruit is in you. And the spirit is developing and creating this fruit within you. The answer is to this question, how can we do it? Can I shake your ground a little bit? You can't. You're told, do these things. But I tell you, you cannot do it. It's not up to you. You can't go out there and read your Bible enough and pray enough and and say no to enough things. You cannot do it. You never intended to do it. It is not your job. We'll see this from Scripture. Christ himself causes you to walk in the Spirit. These verses are not saying that this is what you should act like. Please understand this. These verses that we read is not like, hey, you're a Christian. Come on. Get with it. That is not what these verses are saying. They're saying this is what you look like. Believe this. It is you. It is happening. It is in progress. It's inevitable. This is the fruit. But I'm not. No, 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 no. Get back with the program. This is you. It is Christ who dwells in you, called the Holy Spirit. It's not up to you. It was up to Christ. You don't have the power, but you have the power of the Holy Spirit. You don't have the motivation or the discipline, but you have the justification, which brings you sanctification. It wasn't up to you at justification, and it's not up to you for your sanctification. You are not able to do this alone. It is finished. Christ did it. Christ died. He sanctifies What God wants you to do is to love and serve others, to live in Christ to enjoy the freedom in Christ, to love others as yourself. When verse 16 tells you walk by the Spirit, it also liberates you from the burden altogether. It assures you that you are living the Christian life as God would have you live. But it's going to happen in His terms and in His way. So here's the what, why, and how. What exactly does it mean to walk in the Spirit? 
And why must we walk in the Spirit? And how do I walk in the Spirit? These are things we should be looking at carefully as we study this passage. One thing to be observant is we are led by the Spirit. We cannot follow. If it was good fellowship, then that means it would be up to you. We are led by the Spirit. We cannot follow. It's almost like He lifts us up. As we, we are being led by Christ, it's kind of like that footprint story where you look back and there's only one set of footprints. No, He lifts you up and leads. It's often been said good leadership requires good fellowship, but not in spiritual terms. Good, good leadership requires faith and belief. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Here it says, if you are led by the Spirit, he does not say if you follow the Spirit, but rather if you are led by the Spirit. Meaning that we do not follow the Spirit, but we are led by the Spirit. Here is the, he is the leader of our lives, but he is not the kind of leader you are even able to follow. And if you do not follow, you will miss the way. He is the kind of leader who carries you along in his very own power. When a Christian is freed in Christ, the Spirit himself sweeps, sweeps us up and leads us along. The fruit of the Spirit must be attached to the vine. There's another verse we can look at to understand I'm going to skip that because I'm going to come back to it. A promise that I want us to, to get a hold of here is this. One answer in verse 16 and the, uh, the other answer in verse 18, Paul tells us that the incentive to walk in the Spirit is that you will not end up gratifying the desires of the flesh or the sinful nature of your flesh. So if we read verse 16, it says, So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. It is important that we read this properly, and you will not be gratifying the desires of the sinful nature. This is not a command that you have to go work to keep. This is, this is not based on your performance. This is a promise to you that you can hold on and simply believe as the same faith that is required to put your faith in Christ and by grace you have been saved through faith. It's through faith I am being sanctified and led by the Spirit. It's the same faith. Not a lot of it, just a little. We're trusting His promises. The flesh, as we've studied, sinful desire to be God, to have our own way. Maybe our ego, good definition of flesh. When the Bible talks about the sinful nature, it is referring not only to our body, but our ego. The inner part of you which lusts after things of this world, the part of you that wants to be the center of all things, the part that considers itself supreme and wants to be honored and glorified rather than surrendering to the glory and the honor of God himself. It is a part of us that does not want to surrender to Christ. It is a part of us that does not want to surrender to the work he has done and accomplished for us at Calvary. The flesh is always wanting to do things that agree with its old nature. To satisfy what that nature wants, Romans 5 or 8, 7 says, The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. It is unable even if I wanted to, I, I cannot. I'm unable to. Even with the, my best performance, my best foot forward, my greatest effort. This is a sinful nature we inherited from Adam. It is a nature that thinks, you know what, I'll just do it myself. I can figure this out. I don't need you. And we even do that to God. It is our flesh. Remember Abraham and Sarah, not adhering and trusting and putting their faith in the promise God had given them to say, hey, I'm going to give you a baby. Instead, they didn't put the promise there what they do. They said, no, I don't trust you. I'm just going to do it. We're going to do, figure this out on ourselves. And they used their earthly resources to have a baby. And God says, no, I want everybody to know that I'm in charge of this. I want everybody to know what my role in this matter is. Just trust me. Wait. 
It's like fruit. It takes time. He has a different schedule than we do. But there is a battle. It's not up to us, but there is a battle. If you think to yourself that you have a lot of the flesh or sinful desires still left in you, you're right to think that. And that does not mean that you are not a Christian. If you're struggling inside with the old sinful nature appearing to be powerful and it's still kicking, a Christian is a man or a woman who is at war. With these desires, we are fighting. We are at war with the desires by the power of the Spirit, not by our own power. But the Spirit is leading the fight. Conflict in the soul and in your soul isn't such a bad thing. We do long for the day when the conflict is over. When the Spirit's desires will rule our hearts forever and declare the final victory over sinful nature. But until then, there is a conflict within. There's not one person here who would say there is no conflict within my soul. In fact, if you're like me, you're like, come on. God, just get rid of most of you. Just let me deal with one at a time. But until that glorious day, we will deal with this conflict. There is a conflict. If there is no conflict within you, then you may not be a Christian at all. The war you wage by being led through the Spirit in your heart is often evidence that there is a Spirit in your heart. The sign that the Spirit is in you is not that you have no bad desires, but that you are at war with them. So why? Why walk in the Spirit? Verse 16 tells us that when I walk by the Spirit, I will not lose those bad desires. I will not let those bad desires mature or bear fruit. When I walk by the Spirit, the flesh is off to one side, struggling to stay alive. Still kicking, but struggling. New God-centered desires crowd out the old man's desires. Verse 16 promises victory over the desires of the flesh. Not that there will be no war, but that the victor of the war will be the Holy Spirit which indwells you, who always wins. Verse 24 says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. What this is telling us is that the battle has been fought and won by the Holy Spirit. This brings us to our earlier question, why is it crucial that we walk by the Spirit? So that when I do walk by the Spirit, the sinful nature of the flesh is conquered. I was going to do an illustration. I was going to bring a big glass jar or vase and I wanted to fill it up with something dark like coffee as an illustration of our old nature and old self. And we're transformed and we're saved and when we're transformed and saved, we're told that we're, we're being indwelt with the Holy Spirit. And so I want to use as an illustration. It's, you can't, it, just, it just doesn't dump out. And then you, you, it is not the way it works. The Holy Spirit starts filling our lives, and He's indwelling our lives, and He's growing the fruit. And as, that fruit, as He grows that fruit, that dirty water has to go somewhere, and it, it leaves our body. There's less of it tomorrow than there was yesterday. It is not an instance. Now, I don't know why God chooses some people. I mean, they, they, they find 100% freedom from a certain state. They get saved and that's it. I mean, they're like, I showed this all my life. I put it. And some God says, no, I'm going to take my time. I have other things to teach you along this process. The question for us is, do we trust him? Do we believe his process? Are we willing to submit to his will? The other reason it is crucial for me to walk by the Spirit is in verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. We've talked about this. This does not mean that you don't have to fulfill God's law. Actually, I do. And you do. If we remember that we looked at a few weeks ago in verse 13 and 14, that we ought to serve one another in love. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, love your neighbor as yourself. 
So not being under the law doesn't mean we do not have to fulfill the law. The law is just different. It's love your neighbor. All these things. So not being under the law, excuse me, it means that when we are led by the Spirit, we fulfill all that God intended for us to fulfill in the first place. In love and service to God and to each other. Not as a burden, but willingly carried along by the power of the Spirit who lives in us. Illustration would be something like this. I show up at the house. I find out on a Wednesday, Rachel's not home. All my kids are at school. It's very rare that I'm ever home when it's quiet. Right? We have kids and, and Rachel. Just kidding. And so I go home and I'm like, you know, I got, I got 30 minutes. Man, I never do this. What a, what a special. I, I got 30 minutes with... I'm going to, I'm close to the house. I'm going to go, and I'm just going to, I'm just going to lay on the, on the bed or lay, sit on the couch and put my feet up. It's going to be quiet. And I walk in the door, which this never happens, but there's a pile of dirty dishes. I'm just going to go sit down. And I say, you know what? Man, Rachel would, she'd really like it if I put those in the dishwasher. So it's not that I don't have other desires. It's that I'll put those aside for a better fulfillment. So I put those dishes away. It's not that I wouldn't rather be doing something else, right? I'd rather be hunting or fishing or sleeping or whatever. But my desire for, I did, I'm going to do this instead. It's not, I don't do it like, oh, I can't believe I have to do this. It's I get to do this. I get to do this. Our desires are flip-flopped. So it's not that we don't have other desires, but is that they're being replaced. Notice in verse 22 that the first of all the precious fruits of the Spirit is love, which verse 14 tells us that that it fulfills the whole law. And to emphasize this, Paul says in verse 23 that against such things there is no law. What he is saying is that you cannot be under the demands of judgment of the law when the Spirit of God is in you producing the very things that the law requires you to produce. They are coming out of you. It's the love, the joy, the peace, the fruits of the Spirit. They're abundant in those who walk by the Spirit. What are we saying here? Is there another reason? It is crucial for us to walk in the Spirit. Same as the first. In other words, walk by the Spirit because walking by the Spirit produces all the fruits that fulfill the law. But you can't do it. We already covered that in the beginning. How do you walk in the Spirit? How, do you, how, do you, how does this fruit grow? How does it manifest itself in you? You cannot do it. So where is our hope? This is what I'm excited about this morning. After our table talk last week, I left that table talk wishing I had better answers. And I hope these are better. The phrase, walk by the Spirit, occurs only, not only in verse 25, but also in verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. So here we see that the opposite of walking by the Spirit is, namely, giving in to the desires of the flesh. Remember, flesh is the old, ordinary human nature that does not care about the things of God and prefers to get satisfaction from independence, power, prestige, and worldly pleasures. Ultimately, all the good inclinations or preferences or desires that we have are given by the Holy Spirit. Apart from the Spirit, we are mere flesh. Paul said in Romans 7, 18, I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwells no good thing. Apart from the gracious influence of the Holy Spirit, none of our inclinations and desires are godly or holy or good. For the mind of the flesh is hostile towards God's law and does not submit to it because it cannot, Romans 8, 7. It has no choice but to do what its selfish desires demand. The new birth is the coming into of our life of the Holy Spirit to create a whole new array of desires, a whole new plethora, a new menu, new yearnings and longings. And when, they, when, when these desires are stronger than the opposing desires of the flesh then we are walking in the Spirit. For we always act according to our strongest desires. 
Therefore, walk by the Spirit is something the Holy Spirit enables us to do by producing in us desires that accord with the will of God. This is how God says it in Ezekiel. A new heart I will give you, and a new spirit I will put in you. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. Who's doing the work? It's not you. Where's the effort coming from? It's it's not you. Your salvation wasn't up to you, and your sanctification isn't up to you. It's the same answer for both. You are saved by grace through faith, and you are sanctified by grace through faith, holding to what God says to be true, holding to his promises. Faith produces love, and love is a fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 6, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. It's just faith. It's just your faith. What he's telling us here is that genuine faith always produces love. Because faith, when you exercise it, when you have faith and put your faith in Christ Jesus... So if love is what faith produces and love is the fruit of the Spirit, verse 22, then the way to walk by the Spirit is to have faith, to rest in the promises of God and let the Spirit of God lead you. Chapter 5, verse 5, For through the Spirit we eagerly wait by faith the righteous for which we hope. When you keep your heart sure and secure in God, resting on His promises, you are actually waiting for these promises through the Spirit of God and are walking in the Spirit. Again, so how do we walk by the Spirit? We do it by faith in believing in His promises. Chapter 3, verse 5, So again I ask, does God give you His Spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law? By reading your Bible every day and by doing these things and not doing these things? And No. It is by your believing what you have heard. This is very clear to us now. As we have to walk in the Spirit, we walk by the Spirit when we hold to the promises of God by faith. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ that lives in me. The life I now live in this body, I live not by the law. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It is always him doing the work but it does require our faith. Who is the Christ who lives in me? He is the Holy Spirit. Who grows the fruit in you? It is not you. It is a spirit that is bearing fruit. The Spirit of God's Son has been sent into our hearts, chapter 4, verse 6. The life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God. So I believe, Lord, in what you tell me. And by faith, I believe that these earthly things will not satisfy. So I don't need to pursue that, Lord. I believe you. I rest in you. But everybody says this is, but, but Lord, I, just, I trust you. My desire says that, but I trust you. That's not going to satisfy. The Spirit does the growth. The attribute of the Spirit, I'll go quickly through this. The fruit. The attribute of the fruit is this. It's Spirit produced. It is not produced by us, but it is produced by the Spirit. It, that's why it is called the fruit of the Spirit. Not it's fruit of you or fruit of your flesh or fruit of your work. It's fruit of your Spirit. Jesus likewise said, Abide in me and I in you as a branch cannot bear fruit. Of itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you cannot bear fruit. One cannot read this and believe that in their own power, they could work hard and produce fruit. It would be the same as cutting off a branch of an apple tree, sticking it in the ground and thinking it's, it's going to bear fruit. It's not connected to the tree. It's not connected to the root. I did that as a kid. Didn't know better. I thought maybe it would work. It didn't. Attribute two of this 
spiritual fruit. It's as a singular fruit. This word is not fruits. It is fruit. It's not plural. It is singular. So rather than nine different fruits, it's one singular fruit with nine qualities. If you have one, you have all as a believer. Even if you could imagine and exhibit some characteristics that look like the fruit, if it's not being created by the Spirit, if you're manufacturing it, it's just like wax fruit. It's just like fake fruit. It's like an ornament on a Christmas tree. It's just hanging there, but everybody knows it's not part of the tree. The Holy Spirit doesn't want to sanctify fake fruit. He doesn't want to sanctify your actions. You can't work your actions up and say, okay, I'm doing this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do this to gain favor. And the Spirit says, okay, I'm going to sanctify that fruit. He doesn't do that. It's his, it's his work in you and through you. You remember who was really good at creating fruit? The Pharisees. The Pharisees were great producers of wax fruit. They were quite proud of the fruit they produced. But Jesus said to them, even every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Do men gather grapes and thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but every bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. If you have not put your faith in Jesus Christ, your roots are bad. Your fruits are bad. And one day they will be thrown. You will be thrown into the pit of fire. The fruit of the Holy Spirit, the singular fruit, attribute three, and this is what I got real excited about. I'm such a terrible judge. I judge people. Fruit takes time to grow. It doesn't appear overnight. There may be one, I, I didn't look it up, but as far as I know, the mushroom is the only thing that pops up overnight, I think. And it's not a fruit. Is it? I don't think so. To understand how the fruit is produced in us, remember the nature of fruit itself. It takes time. It grows. I'm going to skip something here because I want you to see something. But what is your part in this growth? My friends, you do have a role. You have faith. You cannot control the spirit growing the fruit. It's not up to you to produce the growth. But let me tell you what we do have the responsibility of. We have the responsibility to tend the ground. If you plant a garden, you are not in control. You are not growing that fruit or vegetable. You are simply pulling weeds. You're watering. You're tending the ground. But it is God that does the growing. It is the Holy Spirit. It is he himself who gives growth. But it is our responsibility to make sure that the environment is right for growth to happen. Let me suggest three things. I lied. I'm skipping it. It is our responsibility to be mindful that there is a spirit who is growing fruit. And so I want to be in the right environment. I want to be sharpening iron. I want to be loving one another. I want to be caring for one another. I want to be obeying God in the things he says. Not because I have to. Not because there's not something else I'd, I, I'd rather be doing on a Sunday morning or I could be doing. But because I get to. I'm repenting of sin. When I fall short, I say, Lord, forgive me. That's not loving my wife. But I want you to understand, it's not up to you. Well, Juan, I thought you just said you did this. And, uh, beautiful story. I read this and uh, John Piper shared it. I, I changed a few things. So John, if you're listening to this one day, forgive me. Picture your fle flesh. And this is my conclusion for you, okay? Picture your flesh, that old ego, with the mentality of merit and craving or power and reputation and self-reliance. Picture it as a dragon living in some cave in your soul. Then your heart, then you hear the gospel. And in it, Jesus Christ comes to you and says, I will make you mine and I will take possession of that cave and I will slave, slay the dragon. Will you believe in me? It will mean a whole new way of thinking and feeling and acting. You say, but... But that dragon is me, God. I will die. 
He says, and you will rise to newness of life, and I will take its plan. I will make my mind and my will and my heart your own. Will you believe in me? You say, what must I do? He answers, trust me. Do as I say. As long as you trust me, you cannot lose. Overcome by beauty and by power. You bow and swear eternal loyalty. You bow and say, I trust you. And as you rise, he puts a great sword in your hand and says, follow me. You trust him. He leads. And he leads you to the mouth of the cave and says, now go in and slay the dragon. And you look at him bewildered. Christ, I I cannot. Not without you. He smiles and says, well said. You learn quickly. Never forget, my commands for you to do something are never commands to do it alone. Then you enter the cave together. A horrible battle follows and you feel Christ's hand on yours. At last, the dragon lies limp and you ask Christ, is it dead? He answers, I have come to give you new life. This you received when you believed me. And now with my sword and my hand, we have felled the dragon of the flesh. It is a mortal wound. It will surely die. That is certain. It is as good as dead. But it has not yet bled to death. And it might yet revive with violent convulsions and do much harm. So you must treat it as dead and seal the cave as a tomb. The Lord of darkness may cause earthquakes in your soul to shake the stones loose, but you must build them back up again. And have this confidence that with my sword and with my hand, this dragon's doom is sure. He is finished. And your new life is secure. I think that the meaning in verse 24, which we did not read yet, those who belong in Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, means this. Christ has taken possession of your soul. If you have put your faith in Christ, you are his. Our old self has been dealt a mortal wound and has been stripped of all power. It has no dominion over you. It is as good as dead. The Christian life, the fruit of the Spirit, is a constant reckoning of the flesh as dead. We have to remind ourselves, no, that is, that's my old nature. That is dead. It has no power over me. Looking in the mirror, I am the radiance of of Jesus Christ. I'm the radiance of the Father. I am in Christ. I do not need to fall into that sin. That sin has no power over me. It is a constant reminder of the reality that has taken place. The difference between the Christian life and popular American morality is that Christians will not take one step unless the hand of Christ holds the hand that wields the sword of righteousness. For if he is in you, who can stand against you? Not even you can stand against the work of the Holy Spirit. You are not that strong and you are not that good. God has a great and mighty plan for you If you're his child, if you're not his child, he will spew you out of his mouth. He will cast you into the lake of fire. But if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, he has great and mighty things planned for you. He he has changed your heart. He is changing your heart. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, he is creating a new fruit. And he's growing the fruit in his timing. Are you comfortable with his will and his timing? Don't fall in love with the old nature. Remind yourself, it it is dead. It's doomed. Its fate is secured. It has received a mighty blow. The Christ has crushed the head of death and sin. Don't go back to the things that were slain for you. Do not give in to dead things. 
but, be a, but in newness of life, be led by the Spirit. Have faith in his promises and hold tight to the promises. It is not the amount of faith that you have, but the fact that you have any faith at all in God. Father, I ask God that this truth of your word would give us comfort, Lord, that we would rest in the fact that that the burden is light. It is not heavy. It does not weigh us down because the burden is yours. We cast our cares upon you. You are the great weight bearer. No greater weight has ever been lifted than the weight of our sin. And we do not carry that. I don't even want to say we don't carry it alone. We don't carry it at all. You have defeated it. It lays silent on the side, kicking, starving, gasping for air. We walk in the newness of life, putting our faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, for those in here who have a sin issue, who have an anger issue, who have a trust issue, Lord, for those in here who think it has to be their way and their ego is bigger than their will and desire to see you glorified, help us understand that the Spirit is at work in them. And help us rest and put our promises that's not up to us, but it's up to you. We don't need to satisfy the desires of our flesh. We can simply love you and love others and put others above ourselves. Help us, Lord, to properly place our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And allow the gospel to change everything. In Jesus' name, amen.